You're listening to KPFK 90.7 FM, Los Angeles. Good afternoon and welcome to Middle East in Focus. I'm Esty Chandler. On May 15th, Palestinians all over the world will remember the Nakba, reflecting on painful family histories, personal and cultural experiences of loss and love of their homeland. Memories of over 750,000 Palestinians forced to flee their homeland in 1947 and 48 echo through generations. For Palestinians, Nakba isn't just a chapter in history. And this year will undoubtedly feel more brutal than ever, as along with the rest of the world, Palestinians are witnessing the atrocities of a 21st century Nakba unfolding in Gaza. And something we haven't seen in at least a generation, if not two, here in the U.S., the growing number of college and university presidents choosing to call in law enforcement to violently attack, dismantle, and force American students out of Palestinian solidarity encampments built on their own college campuses in what looks a lot like an attempted political ideological cleansing of higher education in America. After a Palestinian solidarity camp on the UCLA campus was erected on Thursday, April 25th, the administration announced the following day that it did not intend to confront student protesters with police force. So a group of pro-Israel counter-protesters came on campus and caused disturbances overnight on Saturday into Sunday morning, attempting to uh, counter-protest, attempting to counter a protest scheduled on Sunday by the Israeli American Council to denounce the pro-Palestinian demonstrations across U.S. campuses and at UCLA, on the lawn directly across from the encampment. That event included a large screen and speakers, which remained on campus, loudly playing disturbing audio-video content, including sirens and crying children, to disrupt the peaceful encampment morning, noon, and night. Still, the student encampment remained steadfast to their demands of the UCLA administration. On Tuesday night, the encampment was again attacked, this time by over 100 masked assailants wielding pepper spray and fireworks. Video footage shows that neither the police nor the school intervened to protect the student's safety, as the attackers beat students with sticks, used chemical sprays, and launched fireworks as weapons for hours. And for at least an hour of the violence... Officers were captured on video standing about 300 feet away from the area without stepping in. And as of Friday, no arrests had, made in connection, had been made in connection with that attack. But the following night, using the pretext of the previous night's violence, hundreds of law enforcement personnel ascended into the encampment, deploying rubber bullets and co- concussion grenades violently arresting approximately 200 student activists and destroying the encampment. I am enormously grateful to have both Robin D.G. Kelly and Mohammed Abdu back with us today to continue the conversation we began two weeks ago about what is happening on college campuses and how the mainstream media is, for the most part, refusing to tell that story. Robin D.G. Kelly is an educator, historian, and author. His professional career spans several decades and universities across the country, including as the William B. Ransford Professor of Cultural and Historical Studies at Columbia University from 2003 to 2006. Since 2011, he has been the Gary B. Nash Professor of American History at his alma mater, UCLA. Robin Kelly has published several books on race relations as well as African-American culture, music, and history, including Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, and Hammer and Ho, Alabama Communists During the Great Depression, and the very popular Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination. It is an honor to welcome Robin D.G. Kelly back to Middle East in Focus. Thank you so much, Esty. 
And Dr. Mohamed Abdu is a North African Egyptian activist, scholar of indigenous, black, critical race, and Islamic studies, among other disciplines. He's done extensive field work in the Middle East, North Africa, Asia, and Turtle Island. This year, he's the Arkapita Visiting Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University. He's the author of Islam and Anarchism, Relationships and Resonances. I'm enormously grateful to welcome Mohammed Abdu back to Middle East in Focus. An honor to be invited. Assalamu alaikum, shalom al khaim, ST and Robin. Thank you. Robin, I wonder if you can start us off by filling us in briefly about things it's important for us to know about the week long Palestine solidarity encampment at UCLA, their demands of the administration, and if and how negotiations between the students and faculty within the encampment and the administration played out prior to the disbursement order and L.A. police, sheriffs, and highway patrol officers moving in and destroying the encampment overnight last Wednesday. Right, yeah. So you gave a really good, um, I think, summary of how events unfolded. So let me just add a couple of things. One, people need to know what the encampment was like. This was an amazing multiracial, multiethnic, multinational group of young people, undergrads, graduate students, faculty were very present there. Um, to be in the encampment meant signing a community agreement outlining shared principles and behavior. People were were trained in de-escalation tactics. Um, the encampment got a lot of donations in terms of supplies, food, tents. The fact that there was free food, my own students were shocked. They, one student said, is, is this communism? <laughs> And it was just the cutest thing because they use meal cards and they're overcharged just to get food. So I want to emphasize that. I want to emphasize the fact that they had a library, that they had reading groups gathered together. They were making art. They were in teachings about Kashmir, about France Fernon, about tenants' rights. Um, they had prayer, Muslims, Jews, um, Christians. Why is this important? Because part of the attack coming from Chancellor Block on the encampment was that somehow learning was disrupted. There was so much learning going on in that encampment, um, way more than what happens in classrooms. So in terms of of how things unfolded um, and what the, the demands are, the demands were pretty basic. Uh, the biggest demand, of course, was divestment. Um, complete divestment and uh, transparency on the part of UCLA's in investments. You know, divestment meant not just investments in Israel proper, but arms manufacturers, anything related to the maintenance of, of this apartheid state in the war in Gaza. They wanted to end the administration's silence on genocide. They never made a statement. Um, they wanted to promote uh, support BDS, specifically in terms of boycotting any kinds of exchange relations with Israeli universities. Um, and they wanted to abolish policing on campus, which has been a demand for some time. Um, and let me just add one other thing before we talk about the negotiations, and that is the attacks on the camp began the, the, the day the camp started. In other words, part of what the LA Times and the press gives the impression that somehow it was his last couple of days before, um, but that's not true. Uh, you had terrorists. I don't call them counter protesters. I call them terrorists uh, on campus. You know, um, ripping uh, hijabs off of women, threatening to rape, using lots of racial and homophobic slurs, entering the camp, spraying people in the face with mace. They dropped a backpack full of mice into the encampment. Um, then, in addition to the Zionists who came strong, it came strong with elected officials. They came strong with um, people who were considered legitimate, as well as our faculty who supported them. Massive amounts of people showing up. That jumbotron, as you said, 
was right up against the camp, uh, the encampment, uh, making it difficult for people to sleep, uh, to study, to work, and yet they still prevailed. Um, and there were proud boys. I want to emphasize this. There were proud boys on the campus. One was heard saying, we're here to finish what Hitler started, alongside those self-proclaimed Zionists who have beaten kids with sticks and throwing pieces of wood into the encampment. Um, and all of this really escalates. All the time, the students are, are you know, want to negotiate. The administration is kind of hesitant. Um, they know their demands. The students were smart enough to say, any negotiation takes place in the encampment, right? Just like Attica, you come to the encampment in front of everyone. And by the time our executive vice chancellor, Darnell Hunt, um, agreed to kind of show up, this was four o'clock on May 1st. Uh, and there was already an order issued saying that by that evening, the encampment has to come down. So you've already put the students in a very difficult situation. Um, and he didn't do a good job of listening. Instead, it was... Um, you know, defensive, this is what we can do. The, the, you know, we're going to shut this down anyway, so how do you want this to work? And so the students were pissed, rightfully so, um, and said, uh, we're not going anywhere, you know. Um, and so it never really got off the ground because I don't think it was meant to get off the ground. Um, I, I should also say, one other thing, and I don't want to give up too much because we're in the middle of our own negotiations and our own um, investigation, but the administration did the, the, the dirtiest, oldest trick in the book. And I saw this at Columbia, well, many years ago. They offered the Centers for Palestine Studies to the faculty as if somehow that shiny object will make us say, you know what, forget the students' demands. We'll, we'll help you shut down the encampment. It didn't work. Because our, our faculty know better, you know, um, and we stood there. And that night, the violence meted out on the students uh, was horrific, including the, what, the, what faculty who stood up there uh, experienced. I wasn't there because I was actually in a hospital with um, uh, dealing with um, uh, kidney stones. But the next morning, I get out the hospital. I'm down at the jail trying to move uh, kids, you know, back from the jail. And you see these injuries, people shot in the face with rubber bullets, you know, 19-year-old girls. And I say girls because that's what they call themselves, because they wanted to emphasize the fact that you have these 30, 40-year-old men in blue shirts with um, Israeli flags calling them names I can't say on, on the air. And they got shot in the knees, they're injured, they could barely walk, and yet none of them, not one of them wanted to leave until all of their comrades were out of jail. You know, I mean, the, the whole thing makes me very emotional to see that resilience. Anyway, I talk too much, but that's uh, in a nutshell what's been going on. Thank you so much for that. You, 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 it was perfect. Um, and the, the shooting people in the knees just was way too reminiscent for me of what we see happening on the ground in Palestine and the occupied territories. Um, Mohammed, the, Palestine Solidarity Encampment at uh, Columbia Barnard lasted for two weeks, but it was similarly dismantled by the New York Police Department the night before UCLA's was. I wonder if you can give us a brief description of what life has been like on the Columbia Barnard campus since it was taken down and um, what your interactions with uh, the over 100 students who were arrested there and charged for their peaceful First Amendment protected protest and what it feels like, or I should say in what feels like the imposition of martial law being imposed on the campus as President Shafiq has asked the New York police to maintain a presence on campus until at least May 17th. Peace be upon you, um, SD and Robin, uh, generally is an honor <clears throat> to answer your question, desolate, um, barren. The use of 
uh, microwave hearing LRAD systems um, in order to suppress dissent. In addition to now students being evicted on top of obviously the suspensions, police terror, brutality, the forbiddance of student journalists to cover um, the siege that the NYPD engaged in. President Shafiq had now has now called the NYPD the police onto campus twice since 68 um, and riot police to supposedly calm the campus down. Of course, you know, prior to that, every press on earth, including House Speaker Mike Johnson, um, accompanied by the founder of the Proud Boys, were hovering around the encampment and white Christian nationalists were quite aggressive a few days before that. They were trying to scale the gates, yelling, go back to Gaza, calling students monkey or students that were inside. And it's quite, you know, reminiscent of sort of what Robin had discussed, but, you know, an extension of UCLA folks like Bill Ackman and friends, including, you know, Jessica Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld's wife, you know, and they're hiring of protesters, particularly Iranian monarchists, a pro-Israeli group, uh, and the old alliance between sort of the Shah Iran of Iran and Israel. But here we have Eric Adams, right, mayor of New York, uh, Baron Manchusian of the Wizard of Oz or Pinocchio, you know, said, who second only to, to Donald Trump and, and his sort of wanton mendacity, uh, who wants to retire in as he refers to it, the Golan Heights, he wants to retire in Israel, but he refers to the Golan Heights that, you know, actually, surely he would know is located in Syria. That's, you know, occupied land by Israel. But 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 here we have bipartisan partisan support and the henchman, uh, Eric Adams, engaging in a sweep of Columbia University, uh, the arrest of over 300 kids, students. Uh, of course, now we have close to 2,500 nationally. Um, of course, and Eric Adams is, is talking about sort of the radicalization of students. Well, there's nothing illegal in radicalizing students who are not in any case children. Uh, but Adams is confessing, obviously, to violating the First Amendment. You know, I mean, we live in a settler colony for what it's worth, the First Amendment. But then the use of uh, phrases as professionals, Right, who are radicalizing this youth by Adams and his administration. Um, more nakedly, sort of the, the authoritarian use of outside agitators, which which uh, assuredly he knows and has acknowledged, I believe, is a has a disreputable sort of past, right? I mean, it was used during the Jim Crow South and era, right, to demonize civil rights movements. Um, you know, a boogeyman narrative. Right? Uh, the toxic history doesn't prevent somebody like Adams from using it, nonetheless. But then, nonetheless, the use of laws and ordinance that were directly evolved and, and emerged out of enslavement insurrection laws to suppress dissent, kids. And, of course, we can't forget NYPD Chief of Patrol John Chell, who was central in the planning and execution of both raids at Columbia in the past two weeks, who murdered uh, Ortezanzo uh, Bowell in 2008 when he shot him in the back in cold blood. Uh, we have, you know, the grimly hilarious top NYPD deputy commissioner, Daughtry, uh, who, you know, officially mocked when, uh, you know, he, he showed an image of the terrorism book, a short, short story of terrorism. You know, is it sort of the evidence of a master of the masterminding sort of a, a radicalization of youth, despite the fact that it's written by renowned historian uh, Charles Townsend? So the use of tear gas, the issue of flash bombs, batons, um, shot or a shot that was mistakenly, quote unquote, fired off by, you know, um, by an officer. Uh, and we have the NYPD celebrating what they declare to be a phenomenal success of the raids, right? Um, and of course, we, we could sit down and talk and sit down and talk about the fact that this crackdown, NYPD crackdown on Columbia University students, was actually led by a member of uh, the faculty, uh, Rebecca Weiner, right, who's a Columbia professor who le who leads the NYPD Intel division that maintains an office in Tel Aviv. So, you know, Wiener had referred to obviously student rhetoric as, as necessarily, uh, uh, you know, requiring a violent raid. But but here we have Shafiq and, and Columbia, who led in the cops uh, that brutally attacked our students. Uh, concussions, like I said, the firing of a gun mistakenly in a building. We're lucky that somebody wasn't killed. A student wasn't killed. And now, as you noticed, or as you noted, um, uh, we have a campus that's militarized, filled with NYPD officers who've sexually harassed women, 
Um, and for what? Uh, for the takeover of a building that was renamed after Hind Rajab, a frightened six-year-old girl in Gaza who was killed while she was alone in a car, along with paramedics who went to rescue her. Um, you know, and, and, and a building that was renamed in her honor. Uh, so, uh, you know, faculty weren't even allowed on campus till a few days ago. I mean, this is this is the inanity of the situation. Now, now we supposedly are, but students aren't unless you live inside the residential buildings of Columbia. So students feel ostracized from the space of learning. Um, and, and this is the, 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 the violation, if you will. And, and, to, and, you know, we're talking about the upcoming anniversary, as, as you noted, SD, of, of the Nakba. But it, it becomes very important because today, I believe, is, is, is the anniversary, actually, 54 years ago today, actually, of four students at Kent State University who were killed while they were protesting uh, war. The Vietnam War, you know, uh, Alison Cruz, who was 19, Jeffrey Glenn Miller, 20, Sandra Lee Schuer, uh, 20, William Knox Schroeder, uh, 19. Um, and, and we're seeing the same ramifications of not only sort of an anti-war, anti-genocide, pro-Palestinian. And of course, we have the upcoming sort of anniversary on May 15th coinciding with the Nakba of the Jackson State College massacre in, in Jackson, Mississippi as well. Right. Um, in which, yeah, we had the open live firing of, of, of police uh, and the National Guard that killed, you know, uh, four students at Kent State University. Right. Uh, so. Uh, so, yeah. You're listening to Middle East in Focus on listener supported KPFK. I'm Esty Chandler. Very fortunate to be joined once again by. Dr. Mohammed Abdu from Columbia University and Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly of UCLA discussing the violence we've been watching inflicted at the behest of university presidents on their students and faculty with the support, as Robin mentioned, of elected representatives over the past few weeks. Robin, it seems a great irony that on the one hand, our government officials and media elites claim at nauseum that the protracted assault on the innocent people of Gaza is the result of Hamas's refusal to negotiate in good faith, and yet we see minimal will of college and university administrators, as you alluded to, nationally to model diplomacy by negotiating in good faith with their students how do you see that dichotomy, and is there a historical lens that we might t want to look at that through? Right, right. Um, great question. Before I answer it, I just have to respond. I think Mohammed's description of Eric Adams is the best I've ever heard in my life. I have to. I'm going to write that down and repeat it. And have been dealing with him for many, many, many years. Uh, the other thing is that I also want to add that here at UCLA. The cops, UCPD and LAPD, were taking pictures of themselves in the aftermath of the violence. And when they tore down the camp encampments, they weren't trying to save anything. They were breaking things, right? So that kind of violence and that kind of settler mentality that we declared victory over the territory, that's part of, of policing. You know, and it's been it's been it's really a horrific thing. The question I think is really really important. See, I I to me it's not even a dichotomy. I see parallels. For example, it's the U.S. and Israel, right, who refused to negotiate and then blame the Palestinians. Um, so they're like you know they 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 try to give up something and then they create the con the conditions in which it's really not tenable. Uh, and then they say, well, you know, look, um, they're not willing to negotiate because they're terrorists. The university administration is the ones refusing to negotiate, and they blame the students. So this other parallel is that accompanying that reluctance to negotiate is the act of vilification. Hamas, right, are terrorists who want nothing more than genocide. Genocide of the Jews. The students, no matter where they are, Jews included, whether they're members of JVP or not, use terms like intifada, settler colonialism, free Palestine, and God for, 
forbid from the river to the sea as proof that they themselves are the anti-Semites promoting genocide against the Jews. And therefore, why are you going to negotiate with terrorists? So it's not, it's an unwillingness backed by the vilification of what is basically the moral position. And the moral position is we don't want colonialism, we don't want death, we don't want war, we want children to be able to go to school. Meanwhile, for all the people claiming to be terrified by their chants and slogans, um, you know, Israel's military keeps killing Palestinians. That this is the, this is to me the most important factor that gets lost in all these, you know, fake campus battles over language. Um, you've got people dying, actual genocide, and we lose track of this. But this is exactly the point of all, all these distractions. Um, I mean, as far as historical precedent, I think this has always been a strategy. You know, uh, you don't negotiate with terrorists. You, but you have to invent one first, you know. Uh, and I, we saw this happen here on this campus. We saw it happen in 2014 uh, when SJP had their national um, uh, uh, conference. And again, security did not protect them when, when you had these um, mobs of uh, vigilantes attacking the students. There's, there's a lot of, you know, in Jewish Defense League, which I've had dealings with them when I was at UCLA back in the 80s. But this is exactly what, how they operate. You know, um, and we just have to make sure that we could follow the students' lead because the students have been not just brave, but really smart by not going for, as Amir Baraka would call it, the okie doke. You know, they're like, you know, you could call me anti Semitic, but I know what you're trying to do. They're not afraid of that because they know they're not the ones that are anti Semitic. You know, and meanwhile, anti Semitism is a real thing. Yeah, all racism and, are. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and 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 you know, the the fact that I even said what fifteen minutes ago that the Proud Boys were on campus, they had another victory celebration after that. By the way, on campus, um, are aligned with Zionist terrorists who are attacking these students. I mean, how absurd can you get? And I'm not. I'm never going to hear that on on in Congress. You know. No, neither of us will. Um, I want to go back to Muhammad, and I also want to make the point because it occurs to me that you mentioned that the students at New York at uh, Columbia were forbidden the student journalists from covering the story, whereas at UCLA, some of the best accounts of what happened were actually reported by UCLA student um, journalists at the Daily Bruin. So, Muhammad, you know many students, um, including those in your current class have publicly expressed shock and upset over the actions of President Shafiq and her public condemnations of you and your colleagues. Uh, some have expressed their suspicions that the attacks on you are racially motivated. One PhD candidate in her class who described your opinions as, quote, very nuanced, cautious, and well-informed, end quote, commented to a reporter by saying, Quote, in my opinion, Zionists know this, and he has never actually said anything that is worth him getting his job taken away, and that's why they are relying on such attacks to make him look bad, end quote. You've obviously earned the respect of your students, so I wonder what, if any, role you feel racism may be playing in the attacks on you and other academics using this, you know, very popular conflation of anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. Thank you, SD. Um, just for the record, Rob, and I'd, I'd just like to say, you know, the whole Eric Adams description, it actually came from The Nation and, and GTR, an article that they had written the other day. Um, so, so I was pulling off sort of that, that particular analogy, which I thought was, was quite apt. Um, and so far as your question, uh, I don't think that it's just racism. I, I, I think it's, 
given the work that I do in the context of 1492 that I described. And I think it's racism and Islamophobia, the way that, you know, Islamophobia, again, is, is very much um, institutionalized within the U.S. settler state, domestic policy, as well as foreign policy. Uh, again, the U.S. has secret black sites exclusively for Muslims, not for Jews. And this is not to say that there isn't anti-Semitism. Again, with 1492, Muslims and Jews were the ones that were cast as savages and heathens, and that, that was projected onto indigenous and, and our black siblings, a third and fifth who were um, uh, Muslims from the Arabian Peninsula and the west coast of Africa. But it's the FBI that regularly surveils mosques, not synagogues. Uh, again, state legislators... Uh, targeting so-called Sharia law, not necessarily Talmudic law, um, you know, the, the forbiddance of sort of uh, migration, the Muslim bans from Muslim majority countries and, and so on and so forth. When can sit down and talk uh, a great deal, the surveillance, the hate crimes against Muslims, the higher bar for believability in comparison to um, anti-Jewish. Uh, crimes, uh, not that they shouldn't uh, be condemned at all, but the policing surveilling and the criminalization of Islam and Muslims. Um, I'm grateful for my students, uh, as I will continue to iterate. Um, they are my beacon of hope, of, of life, of light. Uh, they are my spine. Um, they are the whip of a tongue by which I learn to speak truth to power. And I do mean I learn from them. They teach me and should, and I believe are teaching us all, particularly as adults, to dream dangerously again, as I say always. As we become adults, we, we're inculcated in, institu we're institutionalized, right? And, and we develop fears and securities. We begin to hold on to pass its elemental material sort of portions of life. And we forget that degree of fearlessness, uh, of stubbornness and so far as staunch values. Um, but but our, our students, and I don't mean to be facetious in, in, in saying children, our youth, <clears throat> are not only fighting institutions like Colombia that are very much entrenched, um, you know, and particularly institutions like Colombia, right? And insofar as, a, again, a badly managed set of assets with in terms of Lockheed Martin and so, and, and so far as Google, Microsoft, dual degree programs with Tel Aviv University, but um, they're fighting a settler state. That's what they're fighting. When the White House is issuing statements and calling these protesters, our youth, anti-Semites, when the real Aotsi Semites are, are, are trying to get into campus or trying to um, uh, lay siege to the students behind the gates or, 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 or um, uh, that comes to show the gravity of what it is that we're contending with of how America is leading this war. And I, I can't help but, you know, go back to what Robin was saying about these encampments, right, of, of these students, because they embody what guerrilla intellectual Walter Rodney and, and had phrased it in, you know, um, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, right? They really represented a culture as a whole total way of life, right? One that embraces a different way of eating, of, of wearing, of speaking, of walking, certain mannerisms in which they treated death, they honored death, martyrdom, and newborns because there were children inside these encampments, families, you know, and, and they also embodied Stokely Carmichael when he said, you know, that the knowledge that I have come with now is not the knowledge that I had then. They reinvigorated there were spaces of learning. Not education, but learning, because they submitted to each other in terms of the learning they had to do coextensively together. You know, and so they embodied revolutionary sort of thought modality, as Kwame Turi had, had noted, in terms of fermenting this, this vibrant spirit of creativity. They weren't out to destroy. On the contrary, they really embodied pure revolutionary ways of being. Uh, they weren't talking about destroying. They were call, talking about building. And this is why we're describing them. And they described themselves, and it was quite obvious to anybody who visited these encampments, is, is a new society. And that's what's so beautiful about it. That's what's so inspirational. That's what I long to in the morning when I'd go down and visit when I when I'd wake up crying right and 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 th that feeling of of carcerality that I felt when I when I also left them at home this is this is why I needed to go see them this this thirst and hunger to be with them I felt my heart was torn when I left them my, my, my heart I, I, has been incomplete <laughs> the last few days I, I had to do a quick trip to 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 talk at at Wesley and then I had the honor of the visiting the encampment there and the talk was on 1492 Islam in Palestine. 
And they invigorate seeing the encampment there grow from 20 to 30 to 100 tents. Um, it was incredible, but, but I miss that here. I miss our kids here because I, I can't see them as often or as frequently. Um, I can't learn. I can't draw off on their spirit. I can't be emboldened by them. Um, and so uh, th th that's that's the challenge I'm, I'm personally facing now, uh, to be quite frank and honest, uh, given the political theater, that Congress, that the settler state, that Shafiq, uh, that the NYPD, again, the confluence of all these settler institutions and the submission that the travesty is the submission, not that it's surprising, of the neoliberal academy towards slapper state objectives, imperial objectives, this complete acquiescence by students who galvanized faculty despite the fact that they were exposed to chemical warfare, chemical terror attacks, and what has happened to that. And and that is not a violent terroristic act. Uh, you know, but but to see how the students in a certain sense, I mean, they had prohibitions against harassment, against littering, against drugs, against alcohol. It was calm. It was festive. You know, the, the, the tension there, even when Zionists broke into the encampment, was was diffused. They were learning, as Robin had noted, you know, how to de-escalate. They were calling out all kinds of militarizations, um, you know, and, and, and yet the, the, the vicious brutality that they had been subject to. Right is is a travesty, particularly since the events of sixty eight. I, I and and the sad thing is, you're out to fight anti semitism. Well, here is Shafiq, who never met with students from JVP or students for justice in Palestine. She sets up this task, this anti semitism task force that completely even does away with any pushback with regards to the ambiguity of how anti semitism is defined, even when faculty had called her out, even when. Students had asked to sit down and meet her, that's and right. that's taken at, at at face value. And 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 everybody's safety is then threatened. Right, everybody's. That's right. And JVP is Jewish Voice for Peace. I always want to disclose that I am on the board of Jewish Voice for Peace National and continue to organize with them in Los Angeles. You're listening to Middle East in Focus on KPFK. We are all so fortunate to be joined once again today by Mohammed Abdu from Columbia University and Robin D.G. Kelly of UCLA. And we're discussing the role of racism in the reaction to these encampments. And I want to dip into talking about the goals of the congressional hearings about them. Robin, as I watched those prior Capitol Hill hearings that resulted in the presidents of Harvard and Penn stepping down— and congressional Republicans, as was mentioned, including House Speaker Mike Johnson's visit to Columbia last week and their calls for President Shafiq's resignation, I, I get the strong sense that their support for Israel and their apartheid governance is being used as a convenient cudgel against the things that they were fighting before the encampments, like DEI mm -hmm. and critical race theory and the further study of structuralized racism here in the U.S., do you see that kind of opportunism being deployed uh, by these you know, right-wing leaders? Actually, not all of them are right-wing that are doing it, um, Right. But also right. elected representatives, sad to say, it's also Democrats. You know, we're seeing that both in New York and here. Um, but do, do you see a, a sort of opportunism being deployed here? No question about it. Um, before I talk about the political opportunism from Congress, just to build on what Mohammed said, there is also um, the opportunism of the, the neoliberal university. The neoliberal university is very good at doing one thing, and that is destroying learning. They, they do that very well um, in the name of, they call it education, but it's really the reproduction of itself. Um, and that's why the biggest fear is donors, trustees, um, and, and, you know, in other words, the, the power brokers behind the reproduction of the neoliberal university. So that said, Universities, even the best of them, as we thought they were the best of them, are kind of primed to collapse in the face of these attacks. You know, I mean, really primed to, to, to just fall apart. And that's why 
Right? It doesn't matter what, it seems like it doesn't matter what kind of education or background or political stance that these college presidents have, um, they just collapse because their job is not to defend, you know, not just academic freedom, but just defend intellectual work, defend justice. Def I mean, you know, these are all universities that have social justice programs. And I'm like, they need to take that off because they can't even defend that. So to go to your question, um, absolutely. Um, you know, as you were saying, it's not just the right. We know what the right is doing. But the liberal media does the same thing. I was, I was listening to, because um, I had no choice, I was in a car, listening to Morning Joe. And they had this whole discussion about what's behind these encampments. And one of the claims was that it's all being directed at woke white girls. <laughs> I'm not making it up. So woke, woke white girls whom they're claiming watched a TikTok video hosted by some anti-Semitic radical uh, because, and they were prepared or primed for it because they had been indoctrinated in the classroom uh, under, you know, critical race theory or race and gender studies and, and thinking about sexuality and, and women's power, a feminism, that all these things prepared them to take in because they were woke um, and that prepared them because this is all anti-American. Uh, and that's how they became or were transformed into kind of naive agents of Hamas, right? That's the culture war part of it. And what we know is that they want to destroy, uh, they don't want to destroy the neoliberal university per se. They want to transform it. They want, it's just like new, new college. They want to transform independent thinking, critical thinking. They want to transform any criticism of the settler state. Um, they want to eliminate uh, anything that would even smell of justice. That's why you can't talk about reparations, right? That's why you can't talk about racism. That's why the victims in, in this whole kind of remaking are basically white people, white men, and not even working-class white men. <laughs> they, they're not even getting a break. I mean, poor working-class white men. And, I mean, because they're, the, they're in the union struggling, right? In any case, um, I see that happening, uh, and I think that unless we can defend ourselves differently, uh, there's really no hope for a university that could stand up. You know, we, we need, and that's why it, there's a kind of silver lining possibly, maybe, I don't know, in the collapse of all this leadership because they're incompetent, they're cowards, and they are not up to the task. And we need to rethink even how we run our universities. That's a very good point. I heard a marketing expert on that show blaming the encampments for the fact that Biden may lose the election and uh, U.S. democracy would be lost as opposed to blaming the one person in power to do something about it, our president. Exactly. Mohammed, a, a really important thing I wanted to get to um, is that, uh, as was import, uh, reported in The Intercept at length a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times Palestine style guide got leaked, and it revealed how their journalists are prevented from honestly covering Israel's brutal occupation and genocide by restricting the use of terms like genocide and ethnic cleansing. They're told to avoid using the phrase occupied territory when describing Palestinian land. The memo also instructs reporters not to use the word Palestine, quote, except in very rare cases, end quote, and to steer clear of the term refugee camps to describe areas of Gaza historically settled by displaced Palestinians expelled from other parts of Palestine during previous ethnic cleansing of parts of the land who are not permitted to, to return to it. The areas that are being referred to are recognized by the United Nations as refugee camps. 
and they house hundreds of thousands of registered refugees. Putting those kind of restrictions on reporting is not only, in my opinion, clear journalistic malpractice and intentionally dishonest, but it doesn't it also give a direct cover for a genocide? And how can journalists at the New York Times honestly report on Palestine if they can't say the word? So can you speak about, uh, you know, your reaction to the revelations that were um, leaked in about the New York Times Palestine style guide while at the same time your every word is being dissected. Thank you, SD. Um, yeah, to pick up where, in responding to your question, and to pick up um, what Robin was 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 discussing, that the, if academia has become this carceral hub for academics, for and within disciplines, right? Um, that proclaims, you know, interdisciplinarity, intersectionality, that uses classical sort of DEI tactics in the hollow promises of, of the U.S. settler empire as sort of a, an extension of soft power, right? Then why shouldn't the New York Times? I, I mean, this 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 is the reality, right? I, I'm reminded by our, our martyr George Jackson, right? And it, it, he said, it, it follows that if a thing is not a building. It follows that if a thing is not a building, it is certainly decaying, that life is revolution and that the world will die. The world will die if we don't read and act out its imperatives. And of course, the shining black prince, Malcolm, it said, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. But it's part of the reality of the post-alternative fact-truth world of this Orwellian 1984 moment. A Empire loves euphemisms, right? Double speak for Steele. steal. And the liberalism is sort of the bosom of white supremacy. Um, first they steal the words and then they steal the meanings, you know? Uh, again, war against terror, preventive war, simulated drowning, civilians killed are referred to as casualties of, of war. CI kidnappings are extraordinary additions, right? But tell me, Again, why should we expect anything different when we recall Julian Assange, when we recall Shireen Abu Akli, who was assassinated as a Palestinian? Al Jazeera's office just got closed down because the Israeli Knesset, this, this beacon of liberal democracy and human rights and pinkwashing and so on and so forth. Uh, this is so much. When the CIA is illegally spying on journalists and lawyers, that had met Assange when 109 Palestinian journalists, at the very least, and media workers and their families have been murdered in Gaza by Israel. When 25 Palestinian journalists, at the very least, have been arrested, 16 injured, four are missing till this day and have been tortured. When three Lebanese journalists were killed by Israel, not even a few months ago. When we see the consistent targeting and undermining of WikiLeaks, the downgrading and censorship of consortium news via NewsGuard establishment organizations. And the, let alone the mass warrantless surveillance of hundreds of millions of, of so-called citizens and journalists. Um, so why not altogether as the New York Times um, forbid words? Forget, forget, you know, forbid language, uh, cast it out. Um, so it's it's not at all surprising um, uh, this revelation, uh, to be quite honest, uh, St. But this is sort of the the extension and extrapolation of even um, again um, uh, the fourth estate, if you will, as part of empire. Uh, the consequences, but it's ex also exposing the facade of the fact that this was never an American dream, as Malcolm said and called it a long time ago. It was always a nightmare. It was always a nightmare. Um, and, and there's a coming to reckoning of truth that our youth realize in that. Um, and it, the question is, what is the settler psyche? And here I'm speaking particularly to diasporas going to in terms of its grappling with the truth of that reality of contending with the fact that if it is a settler colonial society, which I believe that it is, which indigenous and black and radical black traditions have long called it out for what it is, what are we to do in so far as indigenous sovereignty and black self-determination? What are we to do in so far as the creation of alternatives to the dominant order as it exists today? And abolitionists are leading the way. Indigenous land defenders have led the way in so far as that question. 
Um, and, and this is where we need to learn as adults, if you will, how to become organized and not just mobilized as our kids are teaching us. Uh, and assisting our youth in the meanwhile to create that network of organization across encampments, to create mobile encampments. Why aren't we seeing faculty encampments, tenure track faculty encampments? In addition to obviously, I mean, there, of course, there's non tenure, there's, there's adjunct, there's precarious faculty, there are graduate students, but tenure track faculties that have also acquiesced to the liberal order, because we know that there are a lot of those who are silent over the genocide, despite the fact that they have cushy jobs and have become careerists and will manipulate this moment to do research and publish, if they haven't already, articles on decolonization and abolition and that venerates this youth that ought to be venerated. But nonetheless, in exchange for what? Uh, and is this the mining, uh, the trilliaging of, of uh, the harvesting um uh, of 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 youth that are transformed into fodder, but we need to learn how to place our lines on the line, our lives on the line as these youth, and that becomes the challenge. And again, it's only a minority of us that 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 leads this. And I will continue to iterate. You know, organization, as Kwame Touri had noted, is about structures and understanding these structures. And it's the few that lead the way. The Panthers were not large in numbers. You know, and, and neither are the Zapatistas, and there are many movements that we can draw inspiration from in, in, in that regard. So we need to become guerrilla intellectuals like Walter and, and, and embrace this historical moment and to become more than just witnesses to history, but active participants within it at the same time. These are our children, and I'll continue to repeat the statement of our beloved Mumia, who is incarcerated. Our children are what come from immortality, and they are the arrows that we shoot towards infinity. What of our responsibility towards them? What if they are our flesh and blood? They're an extension of our hearts and our souls and our minds, of our bodies. And if a body aches, if, if your finger is ailing because of a cut, because of a wound, does your body not in its entirety feel it? Are you not in painstaking anguish as a consequence of it? And that becomes the question that we as grown-ups need to ask ourselves and contend with. That's right, Americans. You know, we see service members and you hear people thank, thanking them for their service. We need to be thanking our students for their service. Um, in our last few minutes, Robin, a letter sent by the president of the UC system to the Board of Regents confirms, as you said, that at least 15 people were injured. But UCLA chancellor, by the um, terrorist instigators who attacked them, um, but UCLA Chancellor Jean Block's reaction was merely to issue a statement calling the actions by those terrorist instigators um, who attacked the encampment, quote, unacceptable. And while LA Mayor Karen Bass condemned the violence as absolutely abhorrent and inexcusable and called for an investigation as of Friday, not a single arrest had been made in connection with that attack. In spite of many of the assailants having been identified. Um, so it feels like the apartheid that Palestinians experience in Israel and the occupied territories, the harsh punishment meted out for those seeking freedom and equality, and on the other hand, the impunity for the violent assault of those wishing to maintain, as you gentlemen have been saying, that, that status quo. Um, do you think that that is a fair comparison? And have you seen any concern from the UCLA administration for their students and their faculty? Uh, no concern, no statement about um, those who are injured, uh, no promise to pay their medical bills. Um, and in terms of the question, I think that what you're just what's being described here in terms of apartheid uh, Palestine is actually apartheid Israel is actually the application of practices going back to 1492 to bring Muhammad back in because it this has always been the case you know those who commit violence are in some ways arms of the state the terrorists who attack those students are arms of the state uh, I don't want to say anything else because I want Muhammad to have the last word. We have two minutes, Muhammad. Um, I I have nothing of an addendum to 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 add on top of what Robin had noted. Uh, 
we need to redream dangerously again. We really do. Um, I'm tired of people of color settling for the scraps that the white man leaves on the dinner table. We owe ourselves the dignity towards and respect towards our ancestors, our heritages, our cultures, our traditions that stretch millennia, not just hundreds of years, but millennia. I mean, white supremacy, we're talking about 1492, 531 years, but we're talking about millennia histories here that we have to draw on to develop alternatives to the settler state, the nation state as an ideal mode of governance that we re-embody in our day-to-day -day relations and racial capitalism. Um, and, but that re necessitates creating different environments for ourselves, um, contending with you know, our own microfascisms, given how fascism is a mass psychology, the element of humility, the element of maturity. And I can't but help to iterate what the Zapatistas had taught me. Nobody plans revolutions. We hold each other's hands and we ask one another what each of us knows. That is how we don't leave anybody behind. That is the humility, that is the modesty that Malcolm in his beauty embodied and his metamorphosis. Malcolm wasn't no ideologue. He was an organizer and mobilizer. And the beauty of MLK is the very essence of his spirit. He was accountable to his people, um, to our black siblings. They didn't desire to walk the hallways and corridors of power, to assimilate into settler state for some progressive um, menial spectacle that re-emboldens the very structure of settler colonialism. And that was the degree of their imaginary. We have our youth. Mm -hmm. Let us bask upon that light. They are, again, the, the, our very breath. That they, they really genuinely are. And we draw upon their wisdom um, and their grace uh, to, to think that our hijabi sisters had their hijabs pulled off in the encampments, pulled off while they were being incarcerated in prison. Mm -hmm. and, and and the staunch ally, I, I wasn't I wasn't in we, there, but I, I, I know from my kids that right. Those that were not hijabi, that were non-Muslims, were, were fighting back mm -hmm. That's right. with their hijabi sisters to ask for the restoration of that dignity. The degree, if colonialism has stolen everything, it's our ability to drain dangerously to the point that we would bleach our skin white and straighten our hair. Mm -hmm. I we can't, need to think seriously about that. I cannot inv uh, thank you both enough for taking this time once again to really, you know, give us a, a lesson. And um, mm -hmm. it, it means a lot. As Win Without War pointed Thank out you. yesterday, House Speaker Mike Johnson's demand that National Guard troops be sent to confront student protesters should alarm us all. Hundreds of students and some faculty members have already been arrested for protesting against Israeli government's war on Palestinians in Gaza at several universities nationwide. We are seeing them beaten and shot with rubber bullets by police, and that has been shocking and has only increased tension and rancor. Many have seen this before. 53 years ago, yesterday, as was mentioned, on May 4th, 1970, 28 National Guard soldiers fired into a crowd of thousands protesting the Vietnam War at Kent State University. They killed four students and wounded nine others. That protest wasn't very different from the ones we're seeing today. From Columbia to Berkeley and UCLA to USC, students and people across the country are exercising their constitutionally protected rights of free speech and assembly to speak out against the genocide in Gaza and the over eight decades of horrific Israeli military violence against Palestinians that preceded these last seven months. Hundreds of American students have faced a level of state violence we have not seen on college campuses for 53 years. Hundreds of militarized police have swarmed campuses this week, breaking down doors, injuring nonviolent protesters, and even firing a live round in a school building. In Los Angeles, police stood by as pro-Israel terrorists stormed the UCLA encampment with improvised weapons. None of them were arrested. President Biden has consistently failed to show the kind of leadership necessary to meet this moment of crisis. But like both of you gentlemen, I believe that the kind of leadership we need will instead 
emerge from the encampments built by our youth. Once again, I want to thank our amazing guests from Columbia University, Dr. Mohammed Abdu, and the Gary B. Nash Professor of American History at UCLA, Robin D.G. Kelly. I also want to thank Yoke for his production support today. Our theme song is The Overture from Summer Night's Dream by Marcel Khalife. For KPFK Los Angeles, I'm thanking you for taking this hour to put the Middle East in focus. Thank you.